In this video, we're going to talk about the non-uniqueness of antiderivatives. We're basically going to look at the following two questions. How many antiderivatives can a function have, and how different can any two antiderivatives be? Let's just jump to the punchline right now. If a function has one antiderivative, then it has infinitely many, and all of these antiderivatives look pretty much alike. So we're going to spend the rest of the video filling in the details to these claims. And we'll start with a simple observation. The derivative of x squared is 2x. The derivative of x squared plus 1 is 2x. The derivative of x squared minus 13 is 2x. And indeed, the derivative of x squared plus c, where c is any constant, is 2x. Now let's take this simple observation and turn it into a simple question. What is the antiderivative of 2x? In other words, what function would we take the derivative of to get 2x? Well, we've seen x squared works, so does x squared plus 1, x squared minus 13, indeed x squared plus c, where c is any constant. So actually, this question probably isn't phrased correctly. We should really be asking, what are the antiderivatives of 2x, if we want to be grammatically correct? And we have this preliminary answer for every constant c, the function x squared plus c is an antiderivative of 2x. So it's an important question to ask, are there any other antiderivatives? For example, maybe when all the dust settles, once you apply the chain rule properly and look at derivatives of trig functions, and who knows, maybe there's some Pythagorean identity that cancels, and, and lo and behold, this also is an antiderivative of 2x. It sort of comes from someplace else. It isn't, is it, it isn't manufactured by adding a constant. How do we know that this doesn't happen? So we're going to start with a lemma. The lemma is paraphrased as follows. On an open interval, the only way to be an antiderivative of the zero function is to be a constant function. Now, even before we get into the proof of this lemma, let's talk about open intervals. So an open interval is the open interval from A to B, for example, is the set of real numbers that's strictly between A and B. And if we plotted a graph, we would get this familiar looking uh, diagram. Uh, the open interval from A to infinity is just going to be the set of numbers that are greater than X. The open interval from negative infinity to B is the set of numbers that are less than B. And then we can look at the open interval from negative infinity to infinity, which is essentially uh, the set of numbers with all real numbers with no restrictions. So it's just a, an alternate way of writing out the real number line. So these are all examples of open intervals. And what we'll do is we'll call open intervals of this type, we'll call them bounded intervals. And the others we'll just call the unbounded intervals. But these are all examples of open intervals. The open refers to the fact that the, the end point of the interval isn't in the set. Now, why do we care about open intervals? Well, here's a subtle property that makes them handy. Suppose j is an open interval. It could be either bounded or unbounded. And we're going to look at two arguments, x and y, on the real number line. If x is an element of j and y is an element of j, then every number in between x and y is guaranteed also to be inside of j. Or to put it another way, the closed interval from x to y is a subset of j. Now we're not talking about what the rest of j looks like, but what we are encountering here is what we might call a no-gap guarantee. So when you take two arguments inside of an open interval, you're guaranteed that all the numbers between those numbers are also part of that same open interval. So let's go back to our lemma, here was our paraphrase, and we want to write this out a little more officially. So if phi of x is differentiable on the open interval alpha to beta, and phi prime of x is equal to zero for all arguments in that open interval, then phi has to be a constant function. So that's our official statement of the lemma. And now we're gonna prove this lemma. So let's take a look at our picture here. Alpha and beta are possibly real numbers, so the domain of phi would look like this if, if uh, the open interval here is a bounded open interval, but we're going to allow alpha to stand for negative infinity, possibly. We're gonna let beta 
uh, stand for infinity, possibly, or maybe both happen at the same time. In other words, the proof we're about to look at uh, does not depend on whether or not the interval, the open interval, is bounded or not. So we're just going to have this picture of a bounded interval, but just realize that the proof works for an unbounded interval as well. And here's the plan. We're going to prove this by contradiction. So we're going to assume phi is not constant, then show how this leads to a contradiction. In other words, we take this punchline here, and we say, you know, we, we'd like to prove that phi is constant. Let's just see what happens if we assume it's not constant. So that's going to be our operative uh, hypothesis here. Let's, let's, let's assert that it's not constant and see where this leads us. Well, if phi is not constant, then there must be two arguments for which the values of phi are different. I mean, that's what it would mean to not be constant. So let's suppose we have these two arguments where the values are different, and therefore the distance between these two arguments is not zero. Now, we can calculate a secant slope for phi on this interval, and clearly that slope cannot be zero because the change in y, so to speak, the change in the value, is not zero. So that secant slope can't be zero. And now the mean value theorem guarantees that there's an argument in between where the tangent slope is equal to that same slope. Now, let's just take a moment to understand why the hypothesis that we were started with an open interval is important here. In order to apply the mean value theorem, we need the hypothesis that our domain is an open interval. Why? Because we need to have access to all the arguments between these two arguments. We, we need to be able to know that, that phi is differentiable on the interval of arguments between, but we have the no gap guarantee. In other words, our original domain includes these two arguments, and since the original domain was an open interval, we know that all these arguments are in that domain, and so we are able to apply the mean value theorem. Now, at this moment, we have this tangent slope, which obviously is equal to the secant slope, and that's not zero. So we found an argument where the value of the derivative of phi is not zero, but that's a big problem because phi has derivative zero everywhere in the open interval. So we've got a contradiction. This isn't going to work. And where did things go wrong? Well. Everything was deduced logically right from this original assertion that phi was not constant. So that's what got us into trouble. So this can't happen. And if that can't happen, then what's going on is phi must be constant. So that's our proof. Now let's look at an immediate corollary of this. It's a result that follows immediately from this. If, if you have two functions, capital F and capital G, and they have the same derivative value for all x in an open interval, then the difference of those two functions has to be constant. And the proof's really easy. For all x in the open interval, the derivative of this difference function, which of course is the difference of the derivatives, is going to be f prime of x minus g prime of x. Well, that's going to be zero everywhere. And so, by the previous lemma, this function, capital F minus g, has to be a constant function. Now this uh, sets us up for the big theorem, which is going to be easy to prove now that we've got the lemma and its corollary. On an open interval, any two antiderivatives of the same function, f, differ by a constant. In other words, adding a constant to one antiderivative is essentially the only way to find other antiderivatives. So what does this proof look like? It's really easy now. Suppose f and g are both antiderivatives of f, that is, capital F prime and capital G prime, both have the same function little f as its derivative. Well, then of course the values of these two derivatives are equal to each other, so by the previous corollary the difference function is constant, and that's your proof. Now, realize that what happened here happened on an open interval. That was a key part of the hypothesis. So let's just talk a minute about complicated domains. So we're going to look at three functions. They're all differentiable on rather complicated sets. Let's just look at the first case. We would claim that this, is, this function is differentiable 
on the disjoint union of open intervals. So there's an open interval from negative infinity to negative 1, and then an open interval from 1 to infinity. We, let's mention, by the way, that uh, the, the domain of the function includes the arguments negative 1 and 1, but the function is not differentiable at those arguments. So we're merely looking at where the function is differentiable. So we would call this a disjoint union because these two uh, intervals don't have anything in common. If you took the intersection of the two intervals, you'd get the empty set. So they, uh, they're two open intervals and they don't have anything in common. That's what we mean by a disjoint union. Now, if we throw out negative one and one from the real number line, uh, we get a set which is also a disjoint union of open intervals because we have the open interval negative infinity and negative one, union negative one to one, union one to infinity. That is precisely uh, the set on which this function is differentiable. And this is a disjoint union of three open intervals. Now this third example is uh, rather more dramatic because uh, what we're doing is we're taking pi over two and then adding on integer multiples of pi. We've got to get rid of all those arguments from the real number line. And what that leaves is, in fact, a disjoint union. It's a disjoint union of a bunch of intervals of width pi. And in fact, that means there are infinitely many of these. So this is a disjoint union of an infinite number of open intervals. So I'll mention in passing that the set of arguments at which a function is differentiable is always a disjoint union of open intervals. And for those of you who want to put one-sided derivatives into this discussion, well, we're not going to let that happen. So we're going to simplify matters and just look at uh, differentiability from both sides, in which case the natural domain of differentiability is going to be a disjoint union of open intervals. So what is the most general antiderivative of this function secant squared? Well, we know that the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So the most general antiderivative must be tan x plus c, where c is any constant, right? Well, it's a little more complicated than that. In fact, it's a lot more complicated than that for the function tan. So we could, for instance, add 2 to this function to arrive at another antiderivative. So we're just going to take the whole graph and shift it up 2 units. And tan x plus 2 is certainly going to be another antiderivative of secant squared. But the domain is a disjoint union of an infinite number of open intervals. So we've got all these open intervals. And what that means is we actually have the freedom to choose different constants on each open interval. So we could, for example, move the leftmost interval in this picture down three units, and then the neighboring one up one unit, and the next one down one unit, etc. And that freedom allows us to shift the graph around willy-nilly. Um, and so the most general antiderivative of the function secant squared turns out to be specified by a piecewise defined function where we're going to have to conjure up a constant for each of the open intervals in the disjoint union that constitutes the domain of the function. So the point here is that there's a collection of constants, a different constant for each open interval. So now we have a theorem that can characterize the uniqueness or non-uniqueness of antiderivatives. So suppose the domain of f is the disjoint union of open intervals. So part one, given one antiderivative, we may create others by adding constants to it. Moreover, we may choose a different constant for each open interval. And part two of this theorem says the process described in part one is the only way to create new antiderivatives. Now, here's how you would write it out more officially. And I'm not going to go over this because um, it, it, it doesn't say anything deeper than what was just described on the last uh, slide, which paraphrased the theorem. But if you want to be concrete about it, you really have to do some bookkeeping. And, and that's what's going on here. So we're using j as an index set, to and, and various values of j are going to um, give you the various open intervals in which you have to keep track of what's going on. So let's summarize our discussion. How many antiderivatives can a function have? Well, if a function has one antiderivative, then by adding arbitrary constants, you can create infinitely many other antiderivatives.
How different can any two antiderivatives be? Well, any two antiderivatives of the same function differ by a constant. However, if the domain of the function is a disjoint union of more than one open interval, then arbitrary constants can be chosen independently for each of the intervals. So, for example, if you had a rational function and you were looking for an antiderivative, well, if you found one, then you could add a different constant on each of the open intervals that constitutes the domain, and you can get an antiderivative that way. So now we have our answer to the original questions. If an antiderivative of a function exists, then we know how many and how different the antiderivatives can be. But you may be thinking to yourself, there's a very important question that we've left out of this discussion altogether. When does a function have an antiderivative in the first place? Well, that's going to have to be the subject of another video.